Well, the Orioles, without a doubt in my mind, just played their worst game of baseball in 2022. No offense, nothing, and lost to a terrible, terrible Nationals team. That's what's coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap a bad, bad Orioles loss as they fall 3-0 to the Washington Nationals on Tuesday night at Camden Yards. That was the worst offensive performance by far that I have seen from the Orioles this year. That was a disgusting baseball game to watch, but I'm still going to get to the five things you need to know from the Orioles L. Then we'll talk about the roster move that the Orioles made on Tuesday. Well, part of Monday as well, optioning Mike Bauman and then recalling Ryland Bannon back to the major league level. Talk about what his role could be as he kind of fills in for Ramon Arias. And then we'll talk about an upcoming issue for the Orioles starting rotation. Because since they optioned Bruce Zimmerman down to AAA last week, they haven't filled his spot. And they're going to need to by Saturday when the O's need a starter. So we'll take a look at who could start for the Orioles in Chicago coming up this weekend. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Sports Card Investor. Orioles fans, you are going to love this. Today's episode is brought to you by the Sports Card Investor app. Welcome to the world of trading cards reimagined. Stay tuned later in the show for more information on this awesome new tool for collectors. You're going to want to check out the Sports Card Investor app. And after you check that out, make sure you give a rating and a review to the Locked On Orioles podcast, whether you listen on Apple or on Spotify. And make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel right here on Locked On Orioles. Like, comment, subscribe to the videos because we thank you so much for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day and hope that continues every day of the week, Monday through Friday, a new episode of Locked On Orioles. But for your first listen today, we start with a horrendous Orioles loss. I mean, just got done watching the game here as the O's fall 3-0 to the Washington Nationals at Camden Yards on Tuesday night. In game one of a quick two-game Masson Cup series, Orioles fall to 30-39 and on the season with the loss. And frankly, the Oriole offense just was nowhere to be found in this game. It was quite disappointing after, you know, I get the O's offense didn't do a lot this weekend, but they... Still won two out of three against the Rays. Yeah, they won the game one nothing on Friday. Won the game 2-1 to one on Sunday. I get that. The offense did not have a good weekend. But this was horrendous. No runs on three hits for the Orioles against the Nationals team that just won their 25th game of the season. Even with the win, they're now 25-46. and 46. I think they're the worst team in baseball. And the Orioles just looked silly against the Nationals on Tuesday night. But I'll get to the five things you need to know from that one. And the first thing you need to know is what I've been talking about already. That was the worst Orioles offensive performance of the year. No runs on just three hits. Orioles only got one base runner into scoring position the entire game. It was an Adley Rutschman two-out double in the bottom of the seventh inning that was followed by a Rugnetto door strikeout. That was the only time a runner got to second. The only other hits on the day, a Trey Mancini first inning single and a Ryan Mountcastle blistering single as well. Of course, Adley with the only extra base hit. The Oros drew only one walk. That was Tyler Nevin. They had six base runners in this game as Cedric Mullins in the eighth and then Ryan Mountcastle in the ninth both reached on an error at one point in this game. Michael Franco making one of those. But that was it for the Orioles. And uh, yeah, just just horrendous to watch. I mean, you had guys like Austin Hayes. I mean, he had the worst night of them all. Hayes, who's been so good this season, 0 for 4 with four strikeouts. I mean, he was swinging at pitches that were three, four feet out of the strike zone at times. Austin Hayes, I mean, whether he was facing Eric Fetty or Kyle Finnegan or Tanner Rainey, the closer, 
he looked completely lost at the plate, by far the worst he's looked all season. And I mean, you know, obviously Cedric Mullins had the 0 for 4 as well. Santander had an 0 for 4. Things were were not good out there for the Orioles, who combined as a team struck out 10 times to just the one walk. And I mean, Eric Fetty was throwing the ball down the middle. I mean, he throws six scoreless innings for the Nats, and then they get a scoreless inning each from Kyle Finnegan, Carl Edwards Jr., and Tanner Rainey. And I mean, Fetty, you know, he lowered his ERA to 4-4-6 on the year. He has not been good, but six scoreless, four Ks, one walk, two hits for Eric Fetty. And he got a little better, I would say, kind of the fourth, really fifth and sixth innings. But early in this game, he's just hanging breaking balls down the middle, and the Orioles just were not capitalizing whatsoever. So many balls in the middle of the plate that the Orioles just couldn't square up. And I mean, it wasn't like he got crushed. I mean, the O's did get six hard hit balls against him, but that was in six innings. He spread them out. Just a really, really bad performance. But again, as I said, second thing you need to know, really the only guy who it felt like did anything in this game was Adley Rutschman offensively. He had the only extra base hit with that seventh inning double, just roped a ball off the wall in right field for two bases. And it was a really nice at bat in that seventh inning against Kyle Finnegan, who struck out the other three batters he faced in that Oriole seventh. Adley just kept working the count, fouling balls off, got it to three and two, got a fastball, turned on it and ripped it into right field. And although that was Adley's only hard hit ball of the day per stat cast in terms of the exit velocity, he had two other lineouts on the day as well. Now, that seventh inning double was 106.4 off the bat. He had a soft liner in the second inning to first base that did have an expected batting average of 430. And he hit another liner in the ninth inning that was 85 miles per hour off the bat. But a couple of pitches that you felt like, you know, could have been hits for Adley as well. And even his fly out in the fourth inning was 92 miles per hour off the bat. It was just shy of a hard hit ball. So he swung it well, especially compared to the rest of the order. Third thing you need to know as we switch it over to the pitching side, at the very least, Jordan Lyles, eight innings once again, for the Orioles after he had gone four consecutive starts without pitching a full six innings Lyles goes six and a third in this one allowing just two runs on five hits struck out four walked three and threw 92 pitches and lowered his ERA to 4.92 on the season and it had been a struggle especially in the month of June for Jordan Lyles it got even worse on Sunday he was scheduled to start the series finale against the Rays ended up with some sort of stomach bug and could not pitch luckily for him You know, he got the extra day off Monday and then was able to return to the rotation here for this Tuesday night game. And listen, it it wasn't looking good early. He gave up two doubles in the first inning, including an RBI double to Nelson Cruz that allowed one run to score. He loaded the bases with a couple of walks in the second, gave up one run in that inning as well, but was able to limit the damage in the second, get out at just a 2-0 game. And then he threw four consecutive scoreless innings. He pitched into the seventh where he allowed a leadoff single, and then got Cesar Hernandez to pop out and then was removed from the game uh, with Juan Soto coming to the plate. But to get six and a third from Lyles, again, you know, to snap the four-start streak uh, without pitching at least six innings, this is the Jordan Lyles the Orioles have paid for this year. Six and a third, two runs. You'll take that every single time from Lyles. And uh, really, you know, he wasn't at his best by any means. I mean, the Nats, they hit the ball hard in this game. Don't get me wrong. They had 13 hard-hit balls in six and a third. That is not a good number. But he escaped, and it helped that the Nationals do not have a very good lineup. And he only had seven whiffs on 40 swings on the night. Three came on the four-seamer, and three came on that slider, one on the changeup. But he escaped. He got them outs. He ate innings, as Jordan Lyles is known to do. And I'll take this after what's been a, a pretty rough June for him leading up to Tuesday's start. Fourth thing you need to know, the other pitcher that the Orioles used, Keegan Aiken, well, he pretty much did his thing on Tuesday night. And, you know, despite a bad day offensively, the pitchers did well, and the O's only had to use two pitchers. They got the six and third from Jordan Lyles in this one, and they turned it over to Keegan Aiken, came in to face Juan Soto in the seventh inning with a runner on first and one away in the inning. And Aiken goes two and two thirds, allowing just one run on one hit, three Ks. And he was almost perfect in this game, almost perfect. He was perfect for two and a third. He finished out the seventh, got through the eighth, got the first two outs at the top of the ninth, keeping it a two nothing game, and then allowed a solo home run to right field by Lane Thomas that made it three nothing. But that was his only blemish, the solo homer 
36 pitches, only two hard hit balls, and ERA now at 2.53 for Keegan Aiken, who has looked not bad, but just a little shakier in his last couple appearances. But this one looked really good. And, and you know, I kind of discount the home run a little bit. It was kind of a cheapy, just barely into the flag court, uh, you know, down the line in right field from Lane Thomas going the other way. But Aiken got five whiffs on 22 swings. You know, the fastball was not as great command. It wasn't in the zone as much as it usually is, but he got the job done. And uh, he threw strikes as he's been known to do. And again, just one blemish, it was that home run. And I don't even hold it against him too much. I mean, that was a home run that was not even a hard hit ball. Lane Thomas only hit that ball 93 miles per hour off the bat, traveled just 341 feet. That ball had an expected batting average of 080, and it was a home run. So Aiken made a good pitch in most ballparks. That's a fly out to right to end the inning. Just some tough luck to give up the homer. Not going to blame that on him at all. And uh, he definitely looked solid again for the Orioles. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from this Orioles 3 0 loss to the Nationals is that, you know, really for one of the first times this year, the defense kind of let the Orioles down. And I, I know there's been times where it let them down, but. The O's actually made a pretty key error in the second inning of this game. The Nats had loaded the bases with one out in the second. No runs had scored yet. It was still a one nothing game uh, on their run in the first inning. In the top of the second inning, and you know Jordan Lyles got Cesar Hernandez to roll one over to second base to Rugnet Odor, and it looked like it had a pretty good chance of being an inning-ending 4-6-3 double play. But Odor's throw pulls Jorge Mateo off the bag at second. He can't get the out there. He throws it to first. The throw is late. So on a ball that should have been a double play, and at the very least should have been one out at second, the O's got no outs. It made it a 2 nothing game. It kept the bases loaded. Now, luckily, Jordan Lyles somehow got out of that because it was then Juan Soto and Josh Bell, and he got Soto to pop out and Bell to ground out to end the inning and keep it at 2 nothing. It was a really good job by Lyles there. But he should have been out a lot easier. And the O's have turned the most double plays in baseball this year. You thought they'd turn another one. It was a little rough. Now, it was really the only big defensive blemish of the game. They played much more solid defense for the final seven innings. And did it really matter? I mean, it obviously gave the Nats an, an extra run, but the O's didn't score. So it just would have been a 2 nothing loss instead of a 3 nothing loss if that play doesn't happen. Um, but you'd like to see him turn that double play. Maybe a little nitpicky, but it did cost the O's a run early in the game. But did that really matter? <laughs> I mean, they couldn't score. They weren't anywhere close to scoring in this 3 nothing loss. Hopefully they can flush that offensive performance, get back at it against Patrick Corbin tonight, who has been horrendous on the mound for the Nats this year. And hopefully the O's can bludgeon him and uh, split this quick two-game series. But the O's did make a couple of roster moves in between Sunday's win over the Rays and Tuesday's loss to the Nationals. And we will get to those roster moves coming up here in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about the newest sponsor here at Locked on Orioles. And I mentioned it at the top, but that is Sports Card Investor. And the Sports Card Investor app, baseball fan, and you're a fan of cards as well, you're going to want to check this out. Welcome to the world of sports cards reimagined. The Sports Card Investor app is the hobby's most powerful resource. Quickly check the value of your favorite cards, find great deals, and profit from the hobby you love. Available completely free in the Google Play and Apple App Stores, the Sports Card Investor app is a must-have for baseball fans. The app, again, completely free. And you can easily browse over 630,000 cards from every sport with hundreds more added each week, you can check the value of your favorite cards with seven day or 30 day charts, and you can even find the best prices. And here's the best part if you're a collector, you can buy directly through the app with the eBay deals feature. So you don't have to close out of the app, go somewhere else, look at all these different prices. It gives you all the prices right there. You're looking for a certain card, you can find it on the app, you can buy it right there. It streamlines the entire card collecting process. It's it's really perfect if you are a card collector. So download the Sports Card Investor app today, available for free in the Google Play and Apple App Stores, or go to sportscardinvestor.com slash locked on. So the Orioles fall to the Nationals 3-0 in 
on Tuesday night in the Masson Cup Battle of the Beltways, as some of you call it. But I do know there are some out there, including me, who obviously cheer for the Orioles and cheer for the Ravens. But, you know, Baltimore doesn't have an NBA or an NHL team. So do some of us are kind of half DC sports fans. That's what I consider myself. I'm a fan of the Capitals. I'm a fan of the Wizards. I'm a fan of the Mystics. You know, I at least do dip my toe in DC fandom. And obviously, as I said, that includes the Washington Wizards. And speaking of the Wizards, the NBA draft is right around the corner. And one live NBA draft show is not enough for Locked On. The entire NBA channel, including Locked On Wizards, is going live on NBA draft night. So if you have a favorite NBA team, make sure you subscribe now to their Locked On YouTube channel so you get notified when they go live on NBA draft night. That is Locked On Wizards, I know, for most of you. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel so they go live for the draft tomorrow night. But back to the Orioles here after a tough loss on Tuesday. But the O's did make a roster move here before this game because as we talked about on the pod on Monday, Monday was the deadline that each team in Major League Baseball had to cut their roster down to a maximum of 13 pitchers. This was a rule that was put in place in the CBA for this year, but it kept getting extended because of the late start to the season due to the lockout. You know, the league wanted teams to have more pitchers early because guys didn't really get to ramp up in spring training. They kept extending it where you could have up to 14 pitchers. Finally, Monday was the deadline. And so what the Orioles did was they optioned Mike Bauman down to AAA. And that was the move I predicted they would make. I thought it would be because Bauman would have pitched more in Sunday's bullpen game. He ended up only pitching one inning. It was a scoreless sixth when he allowed two hits a strikeout, and no walks, but he did get optioned. Uh, he is now 4-5-0 ERA, seven appearances, 12 innings, 13 hits, six runs, nine Ks, six walks, and a home run for Bauman out of the bullpen at the major league level this year. He's been very up and down, and I don't mean his stats. I mean literally up and down from Baltimore and Norfolk. Now, that was his third option of the year, and as we know in the new CBA, there is the new rules where you can't be optioned more than five times in a season. However, there was another date rule on that, that actually those options didn't start counting until after May 1st. And one of Bauman's options came in April. So although he's been optioned three times, only two of them count. So the Orioles can option Bauman three more times this season, but they have to wait to call him back up because once you send somebody down, they have to be in the minors for 15 days before they can be called up unless they are replacing a player that goes on the injured list. So we're not going to see Bauman for another 15 days. It's been kind of a tough up and down year for him. Hopefully later in the year, he can kind of settle into more of a role for the Orioles. But they sent Bauman down on Monday on the off day to get themselves down to 13 pitchers. But that meant they had an open spot on the roster. It had to be filled by a position player. Now, I initially thought that Jonathan Arauz would fill that spot, who the O's claimed off waivers from the Red Sox last week, the utility infielder who actually ended up making his O's system debut on Tuesday night had a two-run double as he was in the Norfolk Tides lineup. But I thought just because of his versatility, he can play all three infield positions. He's already been in the big leagues this year with Boston over the past couple of years with Boston. The Orioles just claimed him. I thought it would make sense. But the O's went with who I kind of had as my second option, and that is Ryland Bannon, who is getting his second stint in the big leagues. Now, Bannon did not play Tuesday night in his first game back up, was not in the Orioles lineup in their 3-0 loss to the Nats. But I do like that Bannon got this call. And listen, he's not going to play every day, as we saw Tuesday night. He just wasn't in the lineup. We saw him in four games in May, you know, came up in that series in St. Louis, went two for 14 with two singles, five strikeouts, and a hit by pitch, made a couple of good plays at third base. We didn't see much of him. In terms of Bannon in AAA this year, 52 games, 221 plate appearances, a 232 average, a 357 on base, 416 slugging, has eight home runs, but He's been pretty hot recently over the past week. In his last six games before the call-up, Bannon was 8-for-21 with three home runs and six walks at the plate for the Norfolk Tides. So at the very least, he was swinging the bat well, still playing solid defense at third, and, and had earned another call-up. So the question kind of becomes, will he get a bigger sample size than just four games this time around? Because last time he came up because Ramon Arias was having an oblique injury but was not on the I.L., 
This time he's here because Arias has another oblique injury, but actually is on the injured list. And Brandon Hyde gave us an update on Arias before Tuesday's game. He said he's not swinging a bat yet, hoping to do it in the next couple of days. So I wouldn't expect Arias back probably for another week at the least, which means Bannon is going to get a little bit more of an opportunity here. Now, the issue is just because of the Arias injury doesn't exactly directly open a spot for Bannon because as we saw in Tuesday's lineup, you had Nevin at third, you had Mateo at short and Odor at second, and you still also had Richie Martin, another infielder on the bench. So he's got, you know, a couple of spots to try and fill. Now, I do think maybe against a lefty, he would play second base and Rugnet Odor would sit, but you still want to get Martin some at-bats. I would think the Orioles would prioritize at-bats for Ryland Bannon over Richie Martin. Obviously, Bannon's still more of a prospect. Uh, they've seen a lot more of Richie Martin, kind of know more about who he is as a major league hitter. He's more there for defense and base running, whereas they want to get Bannon more at-bats. So I would think, you know, whenever the O's see a lefty, uh, that Bannon will start at second with Nevin at third. They obviously see a lefty tonight with Patrick Corbin on the mound for the Nationals, so I would expect Ryland Bannon in the starting lineup for the O's on Wednesday night. Uh, but I hope he gets more of a sample size than just four games. We can see him you know, try to hit, and he's kind of a, a tweener prospect right now for the Orioles. You know, Gunnar Henderson and Jordan Westberg are now in AAA. They're knocking on the door, and then guys like Tyler Nevin – and, you know, even Mateo are getting more of a chance. And, of course, Urias, when he comes back, getting more of a chance in the big leagues. Bannon's just kind of shoved in between those guys. And even Taron Vavra is, you know, back and healthy at AAA. And, and he's, you know, surpassed Bannon as a prospect. So this is going to be a really important week in the big leagues for Ryland Bannon. I would expect he probably starts around four more games. And it's a tough spot, but he kind of might just need to make an impression now. And, and hopefully he can do that starting tonight in the lineup. But... This won't be the last roster move that the Orioles make this week because they still haven't replaced Bruce Zimmerman in this starting rotation. And because of the off day on Monday, they didn't have to replace him the first time around. But the second time around comes up on Saturday and they will need to make a replacement. So I know it's a little early, but wanted to take a look forward at who could be that starter that replaces Bruce in the rotation when the O's go to the south side of Chicago coming up on Saturday. But first, I've got to tell you about LinkedIn Jobs because I know many of you out there might be searching for a job of your own and many of you as well might be trying to hire for your business. And as the sun comes out, small businesses are back in business. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people you want to interview faster and for free. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. They've got simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by BlueNile.com. Because whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting styles. And if you're looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing, not sure what you're looking for, or you just have questions that need to be answered, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7. They're available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at, and this is important, every budget. So make your moments sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And Locked On Orioles listeners get $50 off purchases of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagement. So use the code Locked On. That is code Locked On. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. So tough loss for the O's 
on Tuesday night. Hopefully can bounce back. Patrick Corbin versus Tyler Wells in the Wednesday night game to finish off a quick little two-game series between the O's and the Nats in the Masson Cup. Of course, they'll play two games down at Nats Park later this year. But after this series, the O's will go back on the road. And that will start with a trip to Chicago where the Orioles will play the White Sox for the first time this season. It'll be a four-game series from Thursday through Sunday. And we are pretty sure that Dean Kramer will start the Thursday game. It looks like Kyle Bradish, despite his recent struggles, will stay in the rotation and start the Friday game. But the Orioles need a starter for Saturday because after another bad performance for Bruce Zimmerman back on Wednesday in Toronto, he was optioned to AAA, and the Orioles have yet to fill his rotation spot. Well, it has been an issue so far because the O's had the off day Monday. They could skip Zimmerman's next start and just continue to roll the guys through because Zimmerman's next start would have been Monday, but there was no game there. So, you know, they have to go with the bullpen game Sunday. They start Lyles Tuesday night. Tyler Wells goes tonight. And then, you know, you keep rolling on regular rest. You have Dean Kramer Thursday and you have Kyle Bradish Friday. But there's not another guy in the rotation. You have another game Friday and you can't go back to Jordan Lyles because that's uh, that's not enough days of rest. You know, Jordan Lyles on Saturday three days of rest, maybe the playoffs in a couple of years if he's still an Oriole, but uh, not in June of a regular season. So the O's need a starter now to replace Bruce Zimmerman and just wanted to take a look at kind of who the options may be to come up and fill that spot for Saturday's game in Chicago. Now, I know you're all going to say D.L. Hall. Unfortunately, it's not going to be D.L. Hall. Biggest thing why? Well, he pitched Tuesday night for Norfolk. And just like it would be short rest for Jordan Lyles, who pitched Tuesday night in Baltimore, it would be short rest for D.L. Hall. He's not making his major league debut on short rest. He's not pitching in any scenario in short rest for the next couple of years. Now, Hall did pitch Tuesday night. Very weird start. He had four hitless innings. He was walking a lot of guys. He ended up going four and a third, allowing five runs, only two earned on four hits, three Ks, a season high, five walks, and a home run, 92 pitches, just 48 for strikes. Probably just needs a little more seasoning in AAA. Maybe a start or two more down there. So it's not going to be DL Hall. Maybe a bullpen game, potentially. Obviously, the Orioles had to do that on Sunday against the Rays with Jordan Lyles scratched late due to the stomach bug. They start Austin Voth. He gives them two and two-thirds scoreless. They go to guys like Brian Baker and Nick Vespi and Mike Bauman in the back end of the bullpen, and they come out with a two-to-one win in that game. Now, depending on how much Austin Voth is used this week, again, there's only you know, three more games before Saturday. If he maybe pitches an inning or so in just one of those games, perfectly plausible that the Orioles could try to get three innings, maybe a little bit more out of Austin Voth and start him Saturday and then go to, you know, Keegan Aiken pitch Tuesday night. Maybe they don't use him until Saturday again. He tries to get three innings as well. And you could certainly do it that way. You know, Voth had the two and two thirds score. This looked pretty good on Sunday. There's obviously a couple other options in AAA. The first would be, you know, Denny Reyes is an option. He is on the 40-man roster. He was optioned down to AAA on June 5th. So it's been the 15-plus days, which means he can come back up at any time. Now, Reyes last pitched last Wednesday. I would assume he's probably scheduled to pitch tonight. Haven't seen Norfolk name that starter yet. So I would assume he's scheduled to pitch Wednesday night. Reyes was just all right in the couple times we've seen him in the big so far. He's a long guy. He's a depth arm. I can see the O's, you know, skipping his start in AAA and using him. But I think more likely would probably be Spencer Watkins, who since returning from the injured list was sent down to AAA, has made two starts down there. His first one was three scoreless innings. His second one was Friday night. It was not as good. Three and two thirds, five runs, three earned on four hits. Did have five Ks, just one walk and a home run. Now, he would be scheduled most likely to either pitch Thursday or Friday for Norfolk this week. So it would be pretty easy for the O's to just push him back either a day or two and tell him you're coming back to the bigs, uh, you're pitching on Saturday. If the Orioles did that, I mean, you'd have to make a little bit of a tough roster move decision in terms of you know which other pitcher you would send down. Voth would be an option. You would have to DFA him. You know, I don't want to see them send down a guy like Nick Vespi at this point. So you're maybe looking at a Brian Baker who pitched a little better again earlier this week. 
So at the end of the day, you know, if the O's do go from AAA, I would predict Spencer Watkins. But honestly, my official prediction would be, I say Austin Voth maybe pitches an inning Wednesday or Thursday, and then he starts, and they try to get three innings out of him Saturday. They try to get three innings out of Keegan Aiken. They don't use him the rest of this week till Saturday after two and two-thirds Tuesday night. And then they go to the back end. It's already worked twice bullpen games for wins this year. You know, that one time to win a series in St. Louis, and then, of course, on Sunday. I say, why not do it again? At some point, though, the O's obviously will have to replace Bruce Zimmerman. I think that's going to be Spencer Watkins maybe for the next time around. And in the future, once his suspension's up, it's probably going to be Matt Harvey and obviously D.L. Hall at some point as well. But we're going to see Matt Harvey at some point. But uh, maybe Bruce is back by then, hopefully. But I do think probably another bullpen game coming up Saturday. But before we even get there, of course, Orioles-Nats tonight, game two of two. Patrick Corbin stinks on the field, stinks off the field. Hopefully the Orioles get to him and make it a 1-1 series split as the O's have their best starter going to the hill in Tyler Wells. And then I'll be back with you coming up on the podcast tomorrow. We will recap everything that happened in game two between the Orioles and the Nats and get you all of your O's news that you need right here on the pod. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.